Hello everyone, my name is Oscar and you are watching the Virtual Fechtschule. For almost as long as I can remember, I have been fascinated with great swords. From watching an all-time Dutch TV series featuring Grote Pier when I was a kid, all the way through playing Medieval 2, Total War and Age of Empires 3 as a teenager. A few years ago, I first picked up the greatsword myself, hoping to learn to wield it like the double cylinder of old. To get there, I first started working with the fight book, written by the Portuguese soldier, diplomat and fencing master, Don Jogo Gomes de Figueiredo. If you want to learn to fight with greatswords too, this video might help you interpret and use this somewhat cryptic fight book. So let's go and have a look. Before we start though, a little disclaimer. I shot this video a year ago uh, in about 32 degrees heat and I did it in one go. Although I'm still reasonably happy with all the interpretations, the form does suffer a bit here and there, so don't pay too much attention to that please. Figueiredo's fight book consists of 32 sequences of cuts and thrusts that he calls regras, or rules, divided up into simple and composite. I decided to first do the full simple rules in one video and then in a later video get back to the composite ones as they are just counterparts to the simple rules that require just a bit more skill and more mobility as well. And once I feel happy about my interpretations of those, I'll be revisiting that topic. Without further ado, let's just start with rule number one simple. The first five rules are all about learning very basic movement skills with the greatsword. The first of these is all about cutting upwards. You can see that I cut with the long edge from the right, tayo, and with the short edge from the left, which is called the reves. Figueredo doesn't really tell us why, but I feel quite strongly that this is because crossing your arms on an upward cut makes things unnecessarily difficult, especially if you wear armor or you have a particularly big and heavy greatsword. Therefore, right long, left short. You could of course ask why you wouldn't do the same thing for the second rule. If I cut that FS from above, so from my left side, I have to cross my arms after all. But this is less of a problem when it happens higher up. Less things to get in the way after all. To make it go smoothly, I cut the tayo, so from my right, all the way through into a point forward guard. This limits the crossing of the hand as much as it can, and it allows for an easy transition everywhere. In this case, just into a FS. And then, after cutting the FS, it's easiest to cut through into a regular high guard on your right side. The third rule was interesting. We're still just cutting, but now we do two cuts per step. I have seen some interpretations doing both from below, or just the first from below and the second from above. And these are all fine ways of doing this rule, but personally I like this interpretation, because it teaches you to double your cuts through the same line. This will become quite useful uh, in later rules. The biggest thing to keep in mind is that the first cut where you don't step should still be done with the edge, so don't turn it into your second cut prematurely. It can help to just make the movement even a bit bigger than I do here and use your entire body. Especially so when you have a very heavy greatsword. The fourth simple rule introduces thrusts. You basically do the same thing as with rule 3 from the right side and substitute one cut for a thrust on the left. Instead of cutting all the way through into that point forward guard in front of the face, I personally like to just pull my arms in after cutting through. This pulls the greatsword into a guard over your right arm, 
from which you can thrust quite well. It pays to take a fraction of a second to stabilize your guard before thrusting, as that improves your accuracy. I personally also have found that it helps when I turn my sword in the thrust to end with the flat sides facing up and down, as that allows for good reach while also a more relaxed position of the hands at the same time. Fifth simple rule is, well, truly simple. For this one, on both sides you remain in place to deliver a thrust and then a step to deliver a cut. This one is truly great to get a lot of repetitions on thrusts over the arm as I described in the previous rule. So this is it, now you know all the basic movements that you need to fight with a greatsword. You can do a lot more techniques of course, but these are the basic building blocks. From here on in, you put these Lego bricks together in different ways to suit different situations. The first thing we'll learn is what happens on the rare occasion that you should meet another person with a greatsword. The short answer is, just fence them, but if you need a neat trick, try rule 6. Basically, you just focus on parry repost, specifically towards shallow targets, such as the hand and the legs. Rule 7 is really fun. It serves to deny a wide street to your enemies, all by yourself. Gandalf quotes are optional here, but recommended. Basically, you move from one side of the street to the other, while making Moulinet-like cuts from above through the same line. Once you get there, reverse the direction and make continuous cuts from the other side. Rule 8 then. Boy, this one is hard. It serves against people with shields, such as the Rotella and is primarily so hard because it consists of a lot of steps that you need to complete in order. The best tip I can give is, I think, turning your head slightly backwards for your second cut in that first sequence, because this allows your cuts to circle more and therefore come in at a more horizontal angle. And this means that the person with the shield needs to change the angle of the shield constantly, which is exactly what you want. They'll get tired of that way faster than you will. Other than that, this rule is great for practicing your core muscle bracing all through a rather long sequence, so I do this one quite a lot for that reason alone. Up next, rule 9. This one works in order to fight against opponents on both ends of a narrow alley. You have to keep your movement smaller for this one in order to make sure you can fight in this very narrow space. You may have to sacrifice some reach for this, but I can really recommend using some obstacles while training this rule. Also, relax your shoulders a lot more than I'm doing here. For rule 10, I'm going to be doing something heretical. Did I say heretical? I, I meant German. See, the sequence is meant to guard a lady. It's 2023 though, and screw fixed gender roles, so let's just talk about a VIP instead. 
If you're guarding someone and want to make sure no one can get to them, they need to stay quite close to you. But with the way I make cuts from above, I felt that my VIP needed to stay quite far back. Introducing some cuts with thumb grip, just like we find in German sources from the early 16th century, or maybe even similar to a Krumphau, made it a bit safer for the VIP to stick close. Combine that with counter-directional stepping, so stepping towards the opposite side that you're cutting towards, and you'll deny a pretty large area in front of you, while not making the VIP too easy to swarm from behind. The next rule, rule 11, concerns great swords on a boat. The idea is here that you're on some sort of a gangplank, crossing from one ship to another, or on the very narrow upper deck of a Mediterranean galley. Regardless, there's all sorts of things above and below that you really shouldn't be hitting, so we'll stick to largely horizontal cuts. You see that the footwork is also adapted to the situation. Rather than passing footwork, we keep to mostly using advancing steps in order to not fall off the side and meet an all too watery death. Rule 12 is meant to help you deal with opponents in front and behind, presumably this time in a slightly wider arc than in an alley. For this I feel that the composite version is a bit more functional as it is more dynamic, but the simple version does teach you a very good skill, turning around to cut towards a threat behind you. Here's a good tip that I got from a friend that does a lot of ballet that is very easy to apply here. Keep your gaze locked on one point for as long as you can. And once you've turned so far that you can no longer keep your eyes on that point, snap your head in the direction you want to cut towards. And again, keep your gaze locked. This seriously mitigates any sense of dizziness that you're going to inevitably experience when turning around a lot of times. Rule 13 will help you guard a cloak. I've very helpfully decided to wear a cloak to this demonstration, but that's a bit besides the point. You can use this particular sequence to do area denial all around a person or object on the ground. This could indeed be your cloak, but also a treasure chest, or of course the real treasure, the friend that you made along the way who just happened to get themselves downed and now you need to keep enemies off them while they are trying to nail their death save. Ah yes, the controversial one. Rule 14 simple against thrown weapons and two-handed polearms. Basically, you beat down the incoming polearm while also moving slightly to the side, and at that point you continue the movement into a spin, after which you can then advance forward again. Not convinced? I can understand that. But then you can watch this full video with pressure testing and sparring, where I dive a lot deeper into this particular technique. Rule 15 is basically just rule 1, but you have to imagine that you've gotten a lot more flexible since then. So pretty much just make your cuts more to the side, so with a greater range of motion. This will allow you to use the sequence to separate people who are fighting. Seriously guys, knock it off! Alternatively, I can imagine it works quite well to push through a line of hostile combatants and make a break for it. So this last one, rule 16 simple, is a pretty nice and relatively easy sequence to fight when you are surrounded. The book says you're in a wide street, uh, with people in front and behind. In military speak, that would be considered being in a target-rich environment. This particular sequence really combines almost horizontal cuts and thrusts in both directions to make sure that you're projecting the threat of your greatsword pretty much everywhere. And I find myself falling back on the combinations like this whenever I have to fight multiple opponents in training. And that is it, a full breakdown of all of Figueredo's simple rules. Let me know what you think about it. Personally, looking back on the whole thing right now, especially the second half, I feel like I may not have fully done justice to all of these rules, especially given that with a year's worth of extra experience, I know that I do a better job with them right now. 
So let me know in the comments down below which ones of these you would like to see me tackle for a more in-depth video. And if you want to support me in doing that, go check out Patreon, like all these amazing people have been doing before already. Right, so hopefully until the next one, and until then, okay doing.